le prochain panel va faire l'objet d'une discussion avec huit intervenants pour discuter de comment fiabiliser le cloud et à quel coût lorsqu'il touche au développement sur des plateformes ou des infrastructures. Donc Bill, la discussion est à vous. Et on invite nos panélistes à monter sur scène. Oh boy, we have an army coming up here on stage. Welcome, gentlemen. Well, terrific. Let me, uh, if, I, if I butcher your names, please don't kill me too badly, okay? But let me introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Cédric de Saint-Martin, is that right here? He is, among other things, Cédric is the developer of uh, SlapGrid, a grid computing agent targeted at cloud computing applications. He is also head marketing at VIFIB, VFIP, Did I, is that French? Is that pronounced very well in French? a startup company which specializes in low-cost cloud. We have Dennis Caramel from INRIA. He's a professor at the University of Nice. Sophia Antipolis, is that close enough? CNRS and uh, INRA Sophia. He's also the founder and scientific advisor to Act Active Eon. And uh, his interest, research interests include distributed and cloud computing. He's also a uh, project lead on a proactive OWZ, uh, or two, OW2. We have Henry Bins, Binstock, right? All right. Uh, Dr. Uh, Binstock obtained his master's in physics in 2000 and a PhD in computer science. Boy, you're more educated than I am. Good for you. Henry founded ML State, the creators of OPA, uh, in 2007 to change the way web applications are developed and run. His goal was to bridge the gap between the industry and academic research. He is the founder of the company currently serving as chairman of the board and CEO. Ignacio uh, Laurent. Laurente. Oh, we have a little Italian here. Huh? So uh, he's a PhD in computer science, UCM, and executive MB from the IE Business School, and full professor in computer architecture and head of the Distributed Systems Architecture Group at UCM, and chief executive advisor and co-founder of the C12G Labs technology startup. And he's the director of the Open Nebula Open Source Project and participates in the main European projects in cloud computing. He founded and co-chaired the Open Grid Forum Working Group on Open Cloud Computing Interface. Where's Nick? Nick's right here. Uh, how are you? Is the uh, Nick Bar uh, Barset is Cloud Product Manager at Conical, the company behind the Ubuntu project. Uh, in his role, he helps organizations uh, define their cloud strategy and build their own cloud infrastructures. And thank you for giving me these cheat seats, by the way. Very helpful. Um, we have uh, Raphael uh, Ferreira. Uh, Is that another Italian here? No? Portuguese, okay. Uh, is uh, E. Novance's CEO and founder, co founder? He started E. Novance in 2008 with the goal of fulfilling a need. Filling in the IT services industry it provides high-end hosting and managed services. We have good, good perspective here, uh, a variety of different uh, uh, points of view. Um, uh, we have Rick Clark. Now that's like English. Good for you. Thank you. From Cisco. He's a principal engineer working on cloud computing strategy at Cisco Systems. Previously, was, uh, Rick was development manager for Rackspace. Cloud Services founder and project lead for OpenStack and the engineering manager for Ubuntu Server and Ubuntu Enterprise Cloud. And last we have, oh.
<laughs> well, we have a, a distinguished panel here, and I'm delighted to be your moderator. Um, we thought it'd be a little more efficient to have me just introduce everybody. But, you know, I think the, the key here is to think about, uh, when we think about resilient deployments in the cloud, the uh, first thing we really need to, you know, to think about is, you know, as demonstrated by the events uh, of earlier this year, in particular some of the, the challenges that Amazon um, had, you know, cloud offerings are not perfect. And I think there's, a, there's kind of a, an illusion in the marketplace that somehow the cloud has to be something different than any other environment. In, in my opinion, I think users need, who are deploying on the cloud need to just take extra care in understanding that this is a third party rather than the same thing they would do internally, right? And it's an unrealistic set of expectations. You know, despite concerted efforts by cloud providers, there will be failures. There is no question about it, right? Due to natural events, technology failures, human errors, and pragmatic actions by users to mitigate the impact of failure of a cloud offering. So I, I, the, uh, the questions for this panel revolve around how can the cloud be resilient to failures? We're going to focus on that today. And what cost does it add to application development when developing on top of a PaaS and IaaS uh, or an IaaS infrastructure? So I'd like to kind of kick this uh, panel off, and, and anybody can volunteer uh, but the first question I'd like to focus on, and I kind of rework some of the, the suggestions that you made, Nicholas, is the whole concept of design for failure is sometimes used to describe cloud IT. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to design for failure? Anybody want to take that? Go ahead, in the middle. So um, as, far as, as, as far as I understand, um, design for failure is, it refers to those clouds where the user um, uh, application or the management tools are um, uh, take uh, ultimate responsibility for availability. So that's how I understand that term. So I think the, the, the word, the sentence designed for failure um, is something that is very much linked to the DevOps concept. Um, we used to have a clear separation between the guy taking care of the bare metal um, that we're handling the high availability of this bare metal. And uh, recently, because of the advances in the cloud, um, the responsibility of the full availability of the solution now fails into the developer, which is also the operator. There is no more distinction between the role of the guy making it available between the guy making the application. And of course, that's more work for one guy, but that's also a better separation of work because you've got a, someone that is in charge of everything and not fights between two people. Uh, just to, 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 to start with disagreeing, uh, I, I think we have to avoid the application to, to deal with failure at some point. So we have to see uh, how we can do that. But I, I'd like to state first that uh, we've been playing cloud as magic things, right? And we've been putting under the hood too many things. And if you think about a large-scale cloud system, uh, we've been hiding many things like failure, of course, that we are talking about today, but we've been hiding the fact that behind a cloud system, there is a very complex uh, scheduling system. If you want to do load balancing, if you want to do multi-tenants, multi-application, if you want to do different level of services that you can bill at a higher price to your customer, you have very sophisticated uh, scheduling algorithm together with, of course, very uh, sophisticated uh, uh, fault tolerance system. And we all know, and many of us with some uh, high performance background, that uh, scheduling is a very difficult issue. And I think cloud computing will be hitting those very difficult scheduling issue in the next five years. And we need to open up a scheduling algorithm. This is one thing that uh, is being done in OpenStack. We, we are doing the same in uh, OW2 Proactive with some 
uh, open plug, open mechanism to, to be able to, to schedule the algorithm with different uh, approach in order to, to gain for resilience in, uh, in the system. So I think that's one of the aspects of the question, to open up uh, the cloud uh, with some uh, scheduling algorithm, for instance. Well, I think that was one of the themes that we, uh, we were going to talk about today, is, is should all of the components be resilient? by design and the infrastructure, or some of it redone at the guest level? And where would the break be if we were to try to break this a bit of apart? Any comments there? Uh, yes, um, indeed. And following what said uh, Nicholas about DevOps, right now, um, we, we used to have an end-tier architecture. But moving to the cloud, now it moved to uh, a yes, PaaS and SaaS architecture, which everybody knows. And when we are talking about resilient deployment, it means that each of those three components should be resilient. The yes should be resilient and should centralize and virtualize the hardware. Then the PaaS should be resilient. It should be uh, a fault-tolerant software to deploy, manage all these applications. And then on top of this, the application themselves have to be resilient. They have to be uh, non-blocking, so to, as said uh, my uh, left neighbor. Uh, and all this resilient, bug-free, bug or at least tolerant, be, being tolerant to bugs, on these three layers, yes, pass, and sus, are the three problems we have to solve. So I take a, a slightly different view, I think, than the opinions I've, I've heard so far. I think that... Um, I think resiliency doesn't belong at the infrastructure layer at all. I think it belongs at the top-level orchestration layer. And infrastructure, just like we saw with, with Amazon, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go down. You need something that's going to... Um, people talk about being a cloud broker or being, uh, federating the cloud. You need something that, at a, a high level that is above the application that is, uh, that is managing. I think that both solutions will coexist. I mean, for example, in our case, uh, many of our users uh, use uh, Open Nebula to build clouds for mission critical applications, and they want us to provide, you know, um, a cloud infrastructure uh, as a service uh, middleware that take a responsibility for uh, availability to ensure, you know, virtual machine uh, and cloud itself availability. But uh, there are other uh, scenarios where you know uh, you can uh, build that uh, availability at the application layer or maybe at the platform or service layer. So I think that we both we could see this. Uh, now, for example, you see telco in Europe. Uh, most of telco companies are providing like a, a more cost-effective solution. They try to compete with Amazon and other premium solutions more oriented to mission critical applications. If this did become more configurable, let's say, and you did provide greater uh, uh, user controls, let's say. Um, where would you uh, see those user controls going? In what areas would they focus? Um, well, I, I think that uh, at least uh, how I see, for example, the, the, the future of cloud computing or next generation of cloud computing from the perspective of infrastructure service is that most of the companies are not interested in uh, the typical cloud APIs. I don't know, uh, EC2 API, for example, because they want uh, a way to have on demand a whole virtual data center. So they have problems, for example, when they try to access Amazon uh, EC2 with the APIs because they don't want their users to be you know, independent customers of the cloud provider. They want uh, the cloud provider to provide a whole virtual data center and delegate to that company, the internal administration of the data center. So it's like you provide on demand a whole virtual private cloud for, for the user. And I think that that's the, the key point. So you delegate to the customer the multi-tenancy uh, for the management of that piece, of that compartment of the cloud. If they are a SaaS provider, for example. Yeah. OK. Other comments? But I think it's uh, interesting because uh, at the same moment you have a uh, lot of provider with um, sell you dreams with the 999 rules in the uh, high availability. And what we saw is the new generation of uh, DevOps don't believe in this dream because they uh, manage by ourselves the high availability in the application, in the orchest orchestration. So we don't, um, we don't know what we have to do about the infrastructure. 
should we provide a high end infrastructure which manages and provide high availability? At the same moment, we have DevOps. They don't believe that, and they want to manage by ourselves, by themselves, the high availability. So we we don't know how we have to do. The, yeah, I, I think it's the very. Of the in many ways, it's very situational, and it depends on the workflow that you're talking about. You know, if it if the customer if the customer being the ISV or the SaaS provider has certain requirements, they're going to better know that than the the underlying infrastructure provider. I think also it's a, a problem of education. Um, I'm talking with quite a few customers, and customers come from different backgrounds, have been exposed to cloud computing for a long time or very little time. Um, lots of people I see coming from a, a, a big virtualization background will have expectation that the cloud should be, the infrastructure of the cloud should be uh, resilient. Guys that have been dealing with the cloud for a while understand that the SLA that they've been using on Amazon, as most of them have been running on Amazon, or on Brackspace, or on GoGrid, is not a miracle SLA. The machine can go down, and there is no notice about it. Um, so they've learned to deal without it, and they've realized that they gained in autonomy and in performance by doing so. Um, and they've also gained a lot in cost, because the hardware that you use to have a non-resilient uh, deployment hard, hard, at the hardware level is a tenth of the cost of the hardware that would be resilient. Why aren't we using tandems anymore? Okay, so um, I think it's a matter of education, and uh, I think it's a, um, we might see people that you know, CIOs that still say, "Oh yes, I want these uh, virtual machines to be 100% available." Well, it's not the right Well, they solution. have no idea what it's going to cost to do that. I mean, it's ridiculous. And, and you guys may be better educated than I on this. Many of the SLAs, for example, that Amazon delivers, it's only around the compute side. It doesn't go through the entire network stack or any place else that there could be failures. Is that, isn't that true? Um, well, the, the SLA is pretty poor all over. It, it, you should be assuming that anything can fail. They'll make sure they restore it as quickly as possible, but we've seen outages for a given region that have lasted close to a day now. Um, so, and this has been happening at the data level, this has been happening at the network level, at the compute level. Um, so clearly there, isn't, there, there, there shouldn't be any expectation that as a single unit, a region will be available. And you should consider that the cloud by itself, considering all of its region, will be available. And maybe to be even uh, better, you should build applications that are, depend on multiple providers. Well, that, the, uh, and we will be increasingly going to multi, multi cloud environments. Over here? Yes, and, and indeed, uh, there has been in the past a uh, big EC2 failure, for instance. And we have noticed what happened to different companies using EC2. Some of them did have a single point of failure, and this single point of failure was located in the part of EC2 that went down. And what we noticed is the whole service went down. While at the same time, other companies who had developed better software on top of this were able to still be online at the same moment with the same failure of the same provider, and they kept online. Why? Because they did not have a single point of failure. They have distributed this on the higher software stack. That's why, in fact, there, as I said previously, there are uh, resiliency uh, to, to offer at the three level, because even from the beginning, if the YAS infrastructure is very poor, then of course we will have a, a big trouble putting resilient hard, uh, software on top of this. But we have to always identify where are the single point of failure in the whole chain and try to, to suppress them one by one. Yeah, maybe I'd like to step back a little bit uh, to to resilience. Maybe not at the level of application only, because you, you seem to say that uh, 
it's too expensive, so you have to do it at the application level, and we don't know what it means to do it at the general infrastructure layer. But if we think about cloud ID, it's economy of scale and mutualization of uh, risk and failure and uh, usage. So maybe there is a, an opportunity to, to have some higher level of services where you take into account at the infrastructure level this resilience. And of course, you will have the user to pay for it, but you can get some mutual benefits to share this risk between applications and provide high value services where you include resilience and you, you put your resilience under some uh, many different applications so you can get a good price for the resilience. Uh, through a portfolio oriented approach. It's not, no, sadly, no, it's not about technology. I mean, you can provide the functionality for resilience. Could you, could you speak up just a little bit so yeah. they can hear you? It's not about technology because you can provide the functionality you know, for, for resilience. The, the point is more about the position uh, that you have in the market. I mean, you have redundancy, you can do that, but you cannot offer a lower cost. You know? So the point is that, I mean, the, I think that this market, there is user communities that are interested in different types of cloud services with different levels of, of, of resilience. So at, at the infrastructure layer, I think no matter what you do, you know, there, there's nothing that's completely resilient. I mean, as, as a good example, uh, Rackspace has a data center in Dallas, Texas that was made to be extremely resilient so that you wouldn't lose power, you wouldn't lose connectivity. But uh, a couple of years ago, someone had a went into a diabetic coma driving down the road and launched themselves up over a hedge onto the electric transformer. <laughs> and in order to get that person out, they had to do something that the, the, the rescue workers required them to cut power for a very large area that took out all the different power zones for the data center, which, which caused a large outage. You know, in, unless we get to the point where we're like the electrical grid, didn't mean to tie those together, but um, we're going to have a problem. You know, unless we have, a, a, unless we have a, a pass layer that is distributing across multiple providers, across multiple regions, you're, you're never going to really be resilient, no matter how much you spend. I mean, there's always things that are going to happen. So um, many public cloud vendor offerings uh, offer to deploy workloads in different regions of the world. How do you choose which ones to use, and should you always try to deploy on a single or multiple regions? Anybody want to take that one? That's an easy multiple choice answer. Multiple. <laughs> so I think using a single region is very dangerous because, well, you. you you, say it, you said it, the data center can go, can go down. And easy, in this case, you have nobody to do but just wait for the data center to come, come back. But if you distribute everywhere uh, the, the servers, not only in data centers, not only in regions, but everywhere you can put it in homes, in offices, where you always have a single computer that works and your service is still up. Yeah, uh, of, of course, following what uh, the other speaker said, uh, we, you have to, to distribute uh, the application in, in multiple regions. Uh, but we have also at the same time to, to think to an optimization problem. And the optimization problem is the more you distribute, the more synchronization uh, happens bef between servers. And then you have to find a good balance between distributing enough in several regions and being not too distributed also to, to keep the, the internal traffic between uh, your architecture uh, lower compared to, to uh, the, the external traffic that really delivers the, the application to the users. I think that's a very interesting point because uh, we have seen many um, workloads that uh, you cannot distribute across different sites for performance reasons. I mean, because they communicate. Um, um, there is another interesting issue. Uh, I also um, have seen uh, several um, companies that uh, they uh, want to distribute the workloads across different sites for performance reasons because they want to execute the service as close as possible to the end user of the service to reduce the latency. You know, you know, many uh, cloud providers are increasingly offering uh, optional or premium priced alternatives for availability, right? They're, uh, for example, mirroring data uh, in a different site. That's one example. You know, how, how do you see these, these options evolving? 
um, and uh, to help users have a better visibility and, and level of comfort? Uh, and how should they be assessed and selected? Any guidance from the panel in terms of how these services will evolve? Well, um, I think there, there is uh, two things that are going to happen. One, there is going to be a multiplication in the next year, next two years of cloud providers, um, where everything seemed to have started with very few players. Now that we have good open source software that is being produced, that is at the level that uh, different provider will require to deploy their own cloud, and I think uh, Raphael could be talking about that. Um, we'll have a variety of cloud provider providing a variety of service levels. Uh, and they will want each of them to differentiate from one another. And this is when we are going to be uh, having, starting to be having some choice. One, because I hope that, and I know that a lot of these providers are going to be using, if not similar, at least very compatible technology, whether they are going to be using Open Nebula or OpenStack, um, they are going to be using a technology that are compatible with each other, giving choice to the user. And the choice will be made not on the name of the provider, but on the specific service, the added value services that they're going to bring to the customer. And I really, really hope that this is going to happen soon because we are dying to see that happening. Right now, there is such a, a big domination of a very few players that it is really, really, really uh, strangling this market, uh, I believe, at the moment. Other comments? Yes, I, I think there is a very big market for um, specialized cloud. Maybe for the streaming video, or for the encoding, or for high-performance web application, financial application, and I think the, the market uh, go there in this direction with specific different platform. Well, I think a point you brought up is, is the key here is with so many more providers coming into the market, both the large traditional players as well as new emerging companies, how are you going to differentiate? If you're providing a vanilla off-the-shelf solution, it's just going to become a price uh, point, right? In contrast to providing either a vertical focus or <laughs> Right, you no, know, it is. It's, it's a dying game. No, nobody makes any margin, right? This business, if we want this business to be a healthy business, you have to make profit, right? Profit is a good thing, you know? Uh, I, I didn't feel that way when I was 18. I very much feel that way at 53. Um, and, uh, but, you know, differentiation will be the key. So where do you see these services going to, to differentiate, either vertically or horizontally? So I guess I, I, I think it's a commoditization, and I think that's good. People still make money on commodities, just not 80% margins. Uh, I think that there will be profit. It'll be much smaller, and I think people have to compete on service. Um, they're not going to be able to compete on technology. When something becomes a commodity, you, you lose that. If they try to differentiate too much, <coughs> they'll, they'll be incompatible. I mean, at some point, we have to have something that is like the electrical grid where you don't really care where it's coming from, start my servers. But there might be certain services that provide specialized services in healthcare, or There could, for regulatory reasons, there, there could. I, I would hope there'd be a, a whole grid of those, too. I think that the minute you have a specialized service that, um, that this, only this one provider provides, you're locked into that provider. And that's, I mean, that, that goes against the whole value of the cloud, in my opinion. Oh, oh, we can't do that. We're not allowed. <laughs> Comments over here? So uh, let's introduce a new theme, and tell me if I'm uh, going to get my, my hand slapped, okay, if I, I get out of the boundaries. But this whole idea of composite applications and composite SLAs, right? This is where we're going, right, in a very short period of time. Ultimately, the customer, whether that customer being is a software provider or an end user is going to want one throw to choke, right? What would be your vision for how these composite SLAs will be constructed that's fair for all of the parties in a composite scenario? Any comments? 
I, I'll go back to the cloud brokerage that I mentioned before. At some point, there's a, there's a single point of customer contact. This is like plugging your, you know, plugging something into the wall. It, it's the cloud brokerage. And I hope that over the next couple of years, we see cloud brokerages form that, that they give you the SLA, and then they deal with the providers behind the scenes. I, I happen to gr agree with you. I'm going to follow up on this particular. Who do you think the cloud brokers are going to be that are going to win? You want me to name companies? Name, name companies. Um, <laughs> I can tell you one that already exists today okay. that provides a composite SLA. It's Dell. Okay? It, Dell it stuck be. their knock, neck out mm -hmm. at Dreamforce and did a deal with Salesforce to provide Salesforce apps, SMB targets. So Salesforce is trying to get out of the, the SMB distribution game. I mean, they'll continue to provide the service, but they're trying to find new, plat, you know, new channels to go to market, right? And Dell stepped up to the plate to combine uh, a variety of Dell proprietary cloud assets with Salesforce, and they're about to announce two or three other partners, and they will be the throat to choke in providing even the Salesforce delivery. Are there other names that you might? So that's one that already exists. Are so there? if I if I have my way, yeah, uh, and it will Cisco will be one of them. So will be me, will be a, a okay. That, that's you know that's not something Cisco is doing now, but that's something I would really like us to do. I think that's so. That's not a pre-announcement. No, there's not a pre-announcement. <laughs> no one has agreed to it, but I would really like to convince everyone to do that. I think that's a good place. I think everyone should want to be there. You know, I, I think the big um, service providers are going to get into this game in a big way. Whether it's the uh, maybe the national, both regional and national, but mostly multinational. The Accentures, the IBMs, uh, they'll step up to the but plate. The service in a big providers way. are going to want to favor their services. And so, you know, it, it's going to come down to who you trust. And I, I think that's why someone like Dell or someone like Cisco that is removed from those service providers is probably uh, a, a better candidate. For or, or they it. will choose a very limited portfolio of assets that they brand, mm -hmm. right, that they're going to put under their umbrella. Like Dell is not envisioning having a, a menu of 75 assets that you can choose from, right? They're going to have five. Maybe it grows to eight, right? So I think that's the challenge that the big guys have, the Accentures, the IBMs, the Wipros, the, you know, the Indian crowd, uh, the Capgeminis here in France. You didn't mention HP. We, we just recently announced uh, an HP cloud, and I think there'll be also a player there. I think all the hardware vendors, um, X or Future, uh, are going to be trying to, be, to, to play there. However, um, I'd like to reset the, 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 the timing of the, this vision. I, I personally, I don't see that happening before at least three to five years from now. Um, and in the meantime, I think that the role of uh, a lot of the people uh, at this round table is to uh, work on making this technology advance in the right direction so that you can have it. Because right now, we are getting close and closer and closer to have the ability to have brokers, but as long as we won't have real compatibility between providers, this will only be a dream, right? Go ahead. Yeah, so I, I think I agree. We are far away from seeing a very strong motion in that direction, and there is one reason, which is the application. Many applications, when you move to the cloud to pass uh, version of those applications, there's a very strong uh, interaction between the, the cloud infrastructure and the application itself. And first of all, this will take time to happen. Interoperability, uh, absence of vendor lock-in will be very difficult to, to achieve. And so it will take time to move into that direction. A and before we get to a stage where we actually have uh, pass application being built and uh, resilience, uh, I think it's a long way ahead of us before it happens. So, so let's, uh, let's follow down this theme a little bit, which is, you know, w when you're moving from a traditional applications development environment to a cloud applications development environment, how does application design change? Or what, what advice would you give to application developers uh, as it relates to doing app dev in the cloud uh, and application architecture versus traditional approaches? Any suggestions? Uh, yes, indeed, uh, the cloud is 
a new architecture. Uh, and it changes quite a bit the way uh, we have to write and conceive the applications that we want on the cloud. Uh, for resilience, for, for instance, we want the, the application to be uh, distributed in their very nature. They also have to be non-blocking, which is very, very important. If you have at, somehow, at some part in your application a deadlock, then it can bring your whole application down. And when using many traditional software development approach that didn't have the problem at the time, then you can build and you can release applications which are not ready for the cloud. So being non-blocking, being distributed in a very own nature is something which is very, very important in the cloud. And there is another thing. We have traditionally built application stacking up layers and layers of software. And the problem when deploying in the cloud where we want all this software virtualized somehow is what happens, for instance, when we update just one component in the stack and what happens if, for instance, it breaks compatibility between those stack components and then the application goes down just because we have updated a small framework uh, which is involved in, in doing, for instance, network uh, operations or, or something like this. So we really have to, to conceive the application for the, for the cloud. That means they have to be distributed, non-blocking in, in their whole nature. Sure. So uh, I agree with that. So j just to make it clear, uh, if you when you run on when you work on distributed application, it used to be the case that we spend so many lines of code into the deployment of your application. And going to pass, of course, the biggest benefit is that you you get rid of all the deployment which comes from the using the, the pass API. But nevertheless, when you we were using to do that, we were using many tricks into the deployment, and many things were actually complex but useful in the deployment for optimization purpose of the deployment of the application, for instance, on a, a large-scale system. So it's not so easy to, to get rid of those uh, optimization. It has a cost, and you, you, you need to, to take care uh, about that. The, the second thing, uh, one, one thing that happened, I think, with distributed uh, system and with uh, the management of a distributed system is uh, the, the failure of uh, dynamic classes management and upload of code and things like that, which resulted into uh, the, the motion that we can see now, which is uh, independence to languages, REST interfaces, and the focus on the data itself. So th this is something uh, which is a clear uh, lesson from the past, which we are taking into account into building a, a PaaS system. And we really have to, to work very hard on that uh, into PaaS system. F fully agreed. So uh, for those of you that are more on the app dev side, clearly there are some n interesting uh, advances being made in in-memory uh, uh, deployment, right? H how does that impact resiliency strategies? Uh, as a For example, Workday is very much a, a uh, going down an in-memory uh, approach and uses a, a SQL database merely for, I think it's MySQL for persistency uh, 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 purposes. SAP, the future of SAP is all about in memory, frankly. So any, any comments in that regard? Um, yeah, I indeed, in memory is very important for, for speeding up the application and especially for speeding up the access to data, which, which can be one of the deadlocks I mentioned and which we have to, to avoid. So, so of course, uh, but there are in memory is one solution, but there can be other solutions. For instance, uh, right now there are not many cloud offers which have uh, disks which are based on SSD uh, because of the cost. Uh, but SSDs can be also one solution to accelerate the access to, to data. So I, I think the problem is more general. I would say that one matter, and in memory is of course a good solution, is what is the, the, the latency of the data access. Yeah. And knowing that in a distributed system, uh, there can be many connections between several nodes to answer uh, one, uh, one software request, then of course we have to, to speed up as much as we can the, those communications. So uh, I'd like to begin wrapping up here in just a few minutes. I'm gonna ask a, a, a follow-up question after the one I'm gonna do which is I'm gonna ask each one of you to provide, 
to the audience, which I assume is a mix of both technology providers and infrastructure providers, as well as IT, senior IT executives, right? What would be your number one piece of advice uh, relative to resiliency that you would give them, okay? So think about that while I ask this question. So um, how can I prevent my workload to be completely unavailable if my cloud vendor totally disappears for technical or financial reasons? So how do you protect your workload in that environment? Well, excuse me. So if your, if your cloud is distributed enough and if you depend on several, several cloud, if you depend on several cloud vendors, you always have a choice. And even if, in case of bankruptcy of a, a cloud provider, you can always use another if you use some kind of meta cloud that use several, several different systems, several, several different clouds. So I think the, that main idea is to distribute again and to use the most, but most possible. Uh, you have to, to use a lot of different providers in order to survive. Because otherwise, you, you will die. Uh, because if you rely only on one or two providers, there is a chance that you will be, you will be lost. I think um, the, the API plays that you use, the APIs, because you will be using multiple ones, that you use Speak up a little bit. Uh, are uh, a very key uh, choice that you're going to make in your architecture. Um, but not only the API, the, the different building blocks, the databases, the database model that you're going to be using, the load balancing model that you're going to be using, are all very, very important component um, in making sure resiliency happens. Um, but the API is going to determine how much of a cost there is going to be for you to switch from one provider to another. And when I see people starting to use multiple services provided by a single provider um, that have absolutely no equivalent anywhere else, I try to remind them all the time that they are building a technological debt into their system. So I, I disagree with you, Nick. <laughs> I think that uh, the API just doesn't matter that much. Um, if you look at uh, Twitter and Facebook, there are lots of things that bridge those completely different APIs. What matters is that the payload is the same. If you have to maintain two separate uh, images that you have to deploy, that, that matters a lot, a lot more. Maintaining the actual disk images of, of things for infrastructure is much more expensive than bridging a very simple RESTful API. Any, any API that I can walk with a, a web browser is just trivial. So, I mean, I think APIs just don't matter anymore. Interesting. Uh, I fully agree with you. <laughs> I have to say that the um, uh, main obstacle to go to another provider is not the API, it's not the interoperability, it's more the portability. To have a, a common uh, standard way to define your, your service and so you can move the service because the API, I mean, it's not a problem there. No. Okay, so uh, why don't we, uh, sorry, we're sorry, in the... Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, let me give you a concrete example. Uh, I decide to build my uh, application with uh, a database service that is provided by a spe through a specific API of a specific provider. I'm not giving names here. How do I switch to the other guy? Okay, so if you talk about database, it could be hard. There needs to be an interaction. Yeah, so, so that's exactly what I was mentioning. The, the, if you're using specific APIs providing a specific server limited to a specific provider, then you're building a debt. And you always do that. I mean, we know that standard API, you always go above it, and you always use a specific API. If there's a demand, though, someone will, will bridge those APIs, just like there was a demand for people to be able to post to Facebook and Twitter at the same time. If there is a demand for people to be able to access multiple database services using RESTful interfaces, it's not a tough technical problem. There just has to be a demand that someone will write something that does it. Okay, we're running out of time, so I'm going to... Uh, to go down the panel, we're going to start at this end, and you will be our final. I, I, I flipped a coin, and that's the way it went. So you have a total. Uh, I know that it takes more. Uh, it's harder to translate from for those of you that are native French speakers into English. But in 50 words or less, okay, that's all you have is 50 words. 
What would be your piece of advice for the audience related to resiliency and the cloud? Open standards, open cloud, open software. That was less than 10. Good job. You get a, you get a star. If you want, in the end, resilient software, try to begin by building the highest, uh, the highest tech better. Um, in the end, it's, it's all about money. Um, figure out how much it costs for you to be down, and don't pay more than that for resiliency. Uh, well, I think that the infrastructure service cloud middleware um, should take responsibility for availability. I think that the components should be resilient uh, by design to ensure the availability not only of the application services, but also of the uh, cloud itself. Um, so we, we designed IN infrastructure since 10 years, and just uh, one thing, uh, infrastructure goes down, so you have to deal with it. <laughs> Do not use virtual machine, because virtual machines requires you to centralize something always. So you prefer bare metal to virtual machine. So, so this is, I think you have to take resilience as a security. You have to take resilience at the lower level of the platform, at the middleware level of the platform, at the application level. And if you get one breach at any level, you're dead. Yeah. So I, I think just to wrap up what I've heard, number one, cloud offerings are not perfect. Failures will happen. We actually have kind of a, a uh, evolution in people's perceptions, right? That they have to be as smart in uh, working with and managing the cloud as they were behind the firewall, right? Pragmatic actions by users can appropriately mitigate the impact of cloud failure. I like that. Quantify the level and financial value of availability. It is all about money at the end of the day. Evaluate and implement appropriate cloud provider options, SLAs, and a variety of these service options. I think there's going to be explosion in there, by the way, in my opinion. And evaluate and implement appropriate design options as I think there is a very different set of approaches as it relates to the deployment of cloud uh, applications. So thank you very much, panel. Merci à vous.